Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Every arcade game, every console video game, and every home computer and every handheld we can get our hands on. Welcome everyone to May 1982 where we're cavorting along playing every single game. Our last one was Yars Revenge for the Atari 2600. Well, it's still called VCS, but by the time the 5200 comes out, they'll call it the 2600. But man, oh man, a great release, a really fun game to play, and as usual, we are unearthing and finding video games that aren't either as popular or haven't been showcased or uh, shown to the general public. This episode is no exception. As we continue after Yours Revenge, our next game is... On the Atari home computer, this is Computer Baseball Strategy. We've already seen this one for the Apple II, so here we go on the Atari 8-bit systems. We usually play on the Atari 800. We shelled out the extra money for it. Let's take a look at the box for Computer Baseball Strategy. Endorsed by Sports Illustrated, just like we saw on the Apple II. It still blows me away. It's funny to see, oh my gosh, it's Sports Illustrated actually licensing or, or giving their title on the front of the, of the box there. This game is crucial. It's the bottom of the ninth. The score is tied. The fast runners at first. The power hitters at the plate. There's one way, no way to tell what the opposing pitcher will throw. This one, don't get too excited. It is a strategy title, which means you are pretty much a manager of your own baseball team. You make the decisions, and then after you execute those, it just runs the game and or plays itself. It's based on early mainframe games or a board game by, I believe it's Avalon Hill. Yeah, so it's, it's the board game turned into video game. What other artwork do we have for Computer Baseball Strategy? Oh, the Advertising Flyer. There's everything else by Avalon Hill. Everything I think here is, yeah, uh, developed by Microcomputer Games. Very nice. With the cassette we're going to be popping into play. Here we go, Computer Baseball Strategy. Developed by 4D Interactive Systems. Published by Avalon Hill in May 5th, 1982. And we're going to speed this up. Cassettes, we don't want to have the full experience of 1982 cassette loading or rewinding here. Love the sound effects. And then we're in. Well, sort of in. You have to read the instruction manual and know that you have to say no when you get to this screen, no when you get to this screen, and then yes to play the game. And now we're in. An Avalon Hill Sports Illustrated game. Started in 1981, and we saw the Apple II version earlier this year. Oh, there we go. So a few different options that we saw before. Let's go big or go home. Hitting three for a large park size. If you've played the board game, it is merely a management tool or a way to play a sports title. And these were popular at the time based on the board game. So you go choice of starters, number of player chosen. This is one player only. So we just pick from the numbers on the side. I'll go number 10. Don't even no no um not endorsed by the, uh, the Major League Baseball Association, so we don't have players or teams. It's literally just just stats, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> that's it. Is, it is one of the front of the box was. If you got Sports Illustrated doing it, just put some random cover in the top. Okay, so number of player here. So again, I'm just picking from the list who I want to have as first baseman. I only get one choice. Second baseman, we'll go with that guy who has no name. It's only stats. Third baseman. So we're just picking all our st uh, our starters for the game we're going to play. Left fielder, center fielder. And you just have to put the number on the side. I guess in your if you were playing this back in 1982, you'd make up what the names were. And then batting order. I'm just going to go with the order they have. Two, three. And you can see it's, it's listed on the side. And I am selecting who I want or which, posi uh, which batters I want to put in. Six and six. I'll do seven and seven. So I am technically not really playing this as the strategy title it's supposed to be. So here we go. The game begins. No music. No sound. I mean, come on. We got the Pokey Chip. This is the Atari 8-bit system. Where's some music? At least something for us. But no. Okay. Now we choose our pitch. And if you read the manual, you'd know you have to do commands to type in what pitch. We want a fastball. We hit F. Boom. And then it tells us what happens. Looks like my fastball didn't work. It went fly out, and you can see they made it to first base. And then next, choosing the pitch, I'll do, let's do a curveball this time. Any difference? No. Still made a single. Uh, it looks like they uh, fouled out the last one. But they do have some animation. Whenever, whenever we played this on the Apple II, there was basically nothing. It was just text telling us what was happening. So we got some kind of animation, but there is, oh, beanball. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, but see, there's not any... There's no action. This is this is strictly putting in commands using a text parser 
or, or using text and then letting it execute. It's very reminiscent to how they played it on mainframe computers or uh, punch card teletype systems where you put in all the commands for all your, your teams and then you just play it out and see who wins. All right, so let's do another fastball. And, oh, another one, okay, good. Fly out, maybe I bean that guy too. But this is how you would play. And this is a single player experience only. We've played another one that was by SSI that allowed two people or more to, or two people to play. And this would be more, uh, I guess, beneficial because this one you have to play against the computer. There is no two player option. All right, so there you go. That is a quick taste of computer baseball strategy, getting some management, uh, get, dipping your toes, playing some management of the, of the game. I'm gonna rate this the same we rated as the Apple II. Of all the games you could play on the computer, I'm gonna say it's a bad title. Two stars considering everything else. I mean, just, just think of every computer game we played up to this point. And there's so many titles that would be considered um, uh, 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 either faster paced, uh, more fun. Uh, there's other titles by SSI. Even this one itself, the, the SSI baseball strategy would be better on that one as well. <laughs> That's right. Maybe it would be more exciting with the punch cards. Yeah, and, and the play against the CPU, the point is that you're not, you're not going to have human opponents to play against all the time. <laughs> Toss it in the landfill. Now, we know there's been other games we, we've seen at this point that w should be tossed in a landfill because we play every video game here. But to play against the computer, it would be a real treat because if you don't have someone else to play with, the computer and artificial intelligence doing the work to play the game was one of the benefits of why you would buy this and play it back in 1982. So I'll still say it for all the computer titles, though, it's a bad title. And uh, especially when you can play a better one by SSI. All right. Yeah, we're going to have more landfill games coming up for sure. And ones that are actually tossed in a landfill, the most popular ones coming up at the end of this year. <laughs> That's true. They should give both options, but they did not. All right. And with that, let's see what our next game is. Yeah. Hills presents in television. In television. In television by Mattel. More sophisticated than any video game that is more before, sophisticated. Providing hours of entertainment. Oh, nice! This like the spark there. Family. In television, <laughs> with one of the clearest game displays available today. What? This system plus a complete line of sports and video game cassettes at Hills, where our game is low prices. There we go. That's right, getting you in the Intellivision mood. This is Sub Hunt for your Intellivision. Let's take a look at Sub Hunt and see what it's all about, starting with the box. There we go. So this one, I like to find actual scans of the box. So as we swivel around, it's not like a reconstructed, kind of cleared up box. I love the the the, the notches, edges worn away. I, I don't want it to look some, like something brand new. So here we go, Sub Hunt, excellent front of the box. They went all out. This is a submarine simulation and television would be the home console to do this on because we've already seen very complicated titles and television likes to push the boundaries of what you really can do with the video game. Yeah. Isn't this fantastic? Even if you, <laughs> I mean, cause you have to imagine you go to the store, you're with your parents. Most likely if, if you were younger at the time and you see the cover, the cover is really what's going to sell it. And we have a lot of games uh, and Atari's doing that. Magnavox obviously is doing that. This makes me, even if the game was bad, I just would want to look at the box art and be excited to play some sub hunt for color TV viewing only. Make sure you got that. And we flip it over in the back. It has sub hunt cartridge. You go to sea in four submarines one at a time. Your mission is to intercept and destroy six convoys of enemy ships. Even though each convoy has a destroyer escort, you can quickly dive and fire depth charges with deadly accuracy and then dive, dive, dive. The chase is on one player versus the computer. Nautical compass, various gauges tell you where you're going. Even if you're submerged, Five skill levels, realistic sounds of battle at excitement as you try to sink every ship in sight. So it is one player only versus computer. And we've had a lot of multiplayer games here. Let's see what other artwork we have for Sub Hunt on the Intellivision. Really excited for this one. I did play this one in uh, the back in the day, and Sub Hunt was another one I didn't have. Here's our overlay, by the way. Very complicated title. And if you didn't have the overlay or the manual, and I didn't, it took a lot longer to figure this one out. You can see lots of commands. Every single button is one something you'll use to control the subs. Yeah, great, great title. And there's the cartridge we'll be popping in. Our Intellivision. And we have the manual. So Sub Hunt, tell us how to play. 
oh, I, my mistake, it is for two players. So I guess on the back of the box, they said one player or against the computer, but you can play uh, two people. Enemy squadron, and your enemy convoy is approaching. You have to destroy your escorts, substations, station subs at sea, stalk your targets, fire torpedoes, evade surface gunnery and depth charges, sink all ships, and good hunting. So you control four submarines one at a time, all four subs. Your targets are six convoys crossing the open sea. Navigate to them, sight ships through the periscope, then fire your ready torpedoes. Take evasive action and sink them. <laughs> the almost unstoppable invasion force to attack your home base. So yeah, it is a sub or naval simulator. You're controlling multiple subs and uh, your overlay, gotta slide that over your controller. There it is. Your movement's gonna be, or the rudder is gonna be the bottom disc, but look at the controls. Another title by Intellivision where they're going way beyond, let's make this a home console video game as complicated as something you play on a home computer. Fire torpedoes, you have on all the buttons on the sides of the joystick you'd have to use. And then you can see you have reverse engines, uh, buttons, but then the front overlay, you're going to need that. If you didn't have that, <laughs> I'm just reminding myself when I played it before, just pushing random buttons, you'll be like, all right, I think this makes you go faster, and I think this, but uh, so helpful having that overlay. I believe it came with two overlays. And before you start, you're going to ask for the skill level. The, the variations in this basically is how difficult do you want the game to be. One star through five stars. The Admiral's game, or hardest level. And I think, I think it's disc for Lieutenant Commander or, okay, you can do the easy level pushing the one star. And all that you can see is uh, right underneath the uh, throttle. This uh, When you set the engine speed, you also do your difficulty there as well. And then they have some screen, uh, screen sh uh, I don't even call it screenshots, just showing you some of the pixel art. So phase one, it does have multiple phases, is just, just deploying your submarines. You have to know your cardinal directions. In a few seconds, the first enemy convoy appears at the west edge of the ocean map, heading eastward, and you have to select to activate a sub. So they're going to be starting from one side on the uh, west side, and then all your subs are going to be on the east side. And then you start selecting your subs and deploying them. You have to guide them by touching the disc to move your subs in this scenario. And then after you get your sub close enough, then it switches to, okay, you can see there's on the left side the enemy convoys. <laughs> yeah, it would. I don't think there's any music that's played in the background of this one. So the enemy convoys are essentially a few pixels. The destroyer will be deployed away from the enemy convoys, and then your submarine needs to engage. And you have different gauges on the, the main screen, the depth, the rudder, the speed, and then your torpedoes. And you'll be able to use all this whenever you enter the next mode. So it shows the situation on the sonar map. And the sonar is essentially where you're gonna be able to see the convoys or the blips where you when you originally deploy your subs. And uh, lots of controls to know about your speed. You can see you can stop the, 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 the throttle, quarter speed, half speed, full speed. Surface speed is about 25% faster at submerged speed. So when you go under the water, you're actually going to slow down. Uh, a lot of work and time went into this one. It feels, and I remember this at the time, whenever I played this originally, this is one of the first naval simulation games I ever played. And it made me feel like I was, it, it was an action, you know, shooter, shooter based. And so you have to get, get the mindset that this isn't going to be a space shoot em up. You got to take your time. Not, we're not playing anything by Sega in the arcades. So here's your attack strategy. When you get near the convoy, your sub flashes slowly. You're now almost within visible sighting range, submerged to periscope level at this point, And you dive one time to get to periscope level. Every time you press this key, you dive 20 feet deeper. And then they show the screen getting bluer and bluer as you dive deeper and deeper. Yeah, I love the overlay that comes with this, and it's really a full package. And it's this is another, another title that's hard to reproduce nowadays unless you have the system plugged up to your CRT and you have the controller in your hand. It's it's very different. I mean, in television games have been put in packages of an anniversary sessions and, and, and compilations of things, and you never really get the best experience unless you can be there in front of the television. I'm doing the best I can here on Chronologically Gaming, but you really need the Intellivision system and the CRT and the overlay and the controller all all, all, all together. All right, so you can see here they're explaining what the, what's going to happen to the destroyer. It's going to come toward your sub, and then when it actually gets in range, you can you can circle around in front of the convoy, and start another attack, but once you actually get the, get on them and it starts the attack mode, you can see the convoy through your periscope if you're one level low or uh, dive one level below. And there's a position on the sonar map as dots. They're dimmer and smaller than your flashing sub figure. And it says with some practice, and yeah, you need a lot of practice. I remember playing this one for weeks before I actually started to get the hang of it. I didn't have the manual or overlay, so that may have been why it took so long. 
So you can see ships on either side head on, depending on whichever direction. If a ship looms very far under the periscope and disappears, it means you've passed it. So you have to also think uh, kind of like a, a battle zone scenario. You know, you're in a first person looking through the periscope and you have to think of yourself in a 3D space. So cool for the time. You can also do reverse. And then it shows you what you'll see through the periscope, just so you know. You know, it's a few pixels, but there you go. The troop ship, the bow or stern view, and then a destroyer of what they're going what to look like. And then your torpedoes need time to reload. After you shoot one, it takes a few seconds to reload, and there's some time between those. Yeah, that's true. There's really not a lot. Oh, Resident Evil 4, the chainsaw controller. <laughs> oh, yeah, nice shout out with that. All right, so we got the maximum range about halfway of the horizon seen through the periscope, and the direction is the center notch of the periscope where you press the fire button. So you're you're using the periscope essentially like a like battle zone, almost like a first person shooter. You have to be on the surface or at periscope level to fire torpedoes, and then the outcome of the game is you need to sink all 36 ships because when you move into one of the convoys on your sonar, it turns into multiple ship ships. The count of sinkings is shown in the top left of the periscope. When you win, you get a spirited victory salute. You're a naval hero. You can also win by sinking many enemy ships that can form an invasion toward you. Okay, so wait a second. I thought at first this was a one-player game, and it said it was one or two players. Where does the two-player come in? Now, it's talking about here you have to sink all ships in the fleet before you arrive at your home base. It'll be very hard to sink three destroyers. It's your last chance to avoid defeat. If the invasion force reaches your home base, the landmass changes color, and the game is over. And then it explains the detail of the skill levels. Higher skill levels, the destroyer escorts are much tougher in battle. Two of them in every convoy. Their deck guns, depth charges are more accurate. You're able to find them uh, more often, even when you dive deep. And the convoys appear more frequently and move faster. Yeah, I guess alternate play, but um, there's not the option for it. It's only given us the option when the game begins for picking your skill level. Yeah. That's true. The it, it, the controller is one of these that makes it unique. And whenever we play these every single game and we're rating every game, you also have to consider what control you get because we, we have a home computer game and it's keyboard only and the keyboard controls are in a weird position or you can't remap them. That does affect your enjoyment of the game. All right, so now I was talking about defensive maneuvers, how, how to make sure you dive. You can dive pretty deep to avoid attack. And then you can also turn off your sonar to make sure the other ships do not see uh, or uh, attack you but, of course, you know, you won't be able to see them on the bottom map. And then you can also hit return to go back to the big map. You can't use the return key while you're in attack range. So I'm looking to see where the option is for two players. So here's the preparation. They have kind of a reference card at the end of the manual of whenever you want to begin the game, selecting your skill level, it shows you which ones to hit. And then when you're in the deployment phase, which buttons to push there on your on your controller. And this is helpful if you don't have the overlay. If you just have the manual, it's telling you which button to push. And then the battle phase on the sonar map and periscope screen, which buttons you use there. And I, yeah, I think this is single player only because there's no option, at least in the manual, telling us where how you play two player, even alternately. All right, time to play some sub hunt. Let's pop in and play the latest on your Mattel and Television by Tom Logery. Way to go, Tom. And Mattel Electronics. All right, so we're going to go bare bones, easy level. So if you want reference down over there in the bottom left, there's our overlay. If we wanted to use the easy or one star difficulty, we push number three on our pad. So there you go, number three. We're in. We're on the easy difficulty. We're in control of the four blipped subs in the very bottom. Now, if I want to control one, let's get with the first one moving. He's highlighted red. I'm going to head over to the west. And then to switch them, I need to hit number seven or C on my pad, and it switches to the next seven. I'm going to move that one too. And it's just continuing to just move to the west until I want to switch to another one. There we go. Let's pick that one and go for the last one. I'm just moving them all to the west and see what happens. We're trying to get in contact with the first convoy, and I think the yeah easy mode just has one. They're not going uh, crazy difficult on us. Let's switch to this one. Let's start moving them up. So you have to manage all of the subs in the sonar view here, and I think we're going to be in contact there. Let's go ahead and stop all the subs and go for just the one I'm controlling because he's going to make it. Yeah. Nice. And they get some music, or I should say um, a, a small ditty to lead us to the next phase. And now this one's different. We are now controlling the periscope. So you can see we're facing west. And if I want to move forward, I have to speed my ship up using the throttle. So let's get some speed moving forward. My speed's represented on the S bar on the right side. How deep I am is the D bar or dive. And then my rudder is left and right. So you can see if I turn, 
a little bit more. The rudder moves, and I'm following, trying to get in touch with or contact with all of them. And we got a nice sonar sound effect happening in the background. <laughs> That's right. I don't think I know it has the I'm pretty sure the book's been out yet, Hunt for Red October, but the movie isn't due till uh, 90s, right? Let's turn a little bit there. Just go ahead straight on. And now we're going to just dive one down. I want to be ready just one level low there. Oh no, there. I want that one. And then we're going to slow ourselves down nice and easy because we're approaching. I'm looking for the destroyer. You're the right in front of us. Here we go. We got somebody. And I'm using the periscope view. You can see the small pixel in the distance getting closer and closer. Nice and easy now. Can I fire off? There's one. Away. Go, go, go. Nice. Okay, we got one down. At least one in the front. You can see on our sonar, it's dropped down. I'm going to keep my sonar going. Going to turn to the right now. See if I can head off a few other ones. Oh, they're already starting to attack me, so I'm going to move in. Let's go for... Yeah, we got a good speed on this one. So I'm moving close. You can see my I'm turning the ship a little bit, or the sub a little bit to the side. Go, go, go. And I got to wait. The reload. Quick, put the other... Get... There it is. Got him, got him, got him. Oh, one more. And you got to wait for the reload now. Nice. And looking at the sonar, it's down. I, I'd say whenever I, I played this originally, I loved the idea of the first-person view. That was the best, or, or the, fun, the funnest part of it. Because it wasn't just a simulation moving, uh, moving units around the screen. It wasn't something tactical. You actually have some of this action. You have to aim and fire. All right, so this one, that's the far west one. I don't want to miss these guys. So I'm going to move over on the left here. See if I can knock them out. He's really close. This will be easy. There we go. Got him. Nice. All this is a great package for an excellent game for the Mattel and Television. Oh, I think we're going to pass him. Or we smash into him. I think if we smash into him, it's not going to be good. Got it. Nice. Okay, we're going to turn back now. So you can see I'm facing south. It's hard to tell down in the bottom of where the sonar is. So you want to use the periscope. I want to turn myself west. Hopefully he won't pass me. I don't have a lot of damage, but it's looking pretty good. Yeah, the sound effects, though, are great. Like you're alone in a sub. Oh, I think we're going to pass. No, nope. or we might smash into him. Quick, 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 quick. Turn a little faster. There we go. Got it. Nice. When you uh, remove all of them, now it goes back to the main view. And uh, now we want, I had all subs stop. So I'm just going to keep our main fleet going here to our next convoy and wipe them out. So we saw in the manual, you just destroy all 36 and that's it. So I don't believe there is a two-player mode. Okay, we're in. Next view. Moving in. And we have to switch to first-person mode. It took me a long time to figure this one out. Because I'm using... Whenever you're on the main sonar view, you can move the disc. And it moves in um, a relative position or uh, absolute position. So it's really simple to move your sub around. But now it switches to something else and you have to realize, oh wait, I gotta push the button for speed. And now I push number three, increase my speed. And I wanna turn the rudder just a little bit north to go catch up to him. I'm gonna plug a second controller in just to see if there is control of the ships. Maybe you control the destroyer as the second player, but it didn't say anything in the manual if it did. All right, so we're just going to head straight west, going for him. Let's go a little bit faster. All ahead full. Go, go, go. And now let's speed up a little bit. I'm at good depth still with this one. And you see the destroyer's coming out at us. Oh, quick, quick, quick. Oh, he's going to pass. Oh, nice. He did a, a move to the side. I think he's like, yeah, he's like right on top of us. So I'm gonna do a different strategy and go down deep because we're not gonna we're not gonna fare too well here. Going down, going down, turning off my sonar so I can't see him, and then I'm gonna head. I'm like uh, high tailing it away from him. Oops, he's still destroying us though. The destroyer is destroying us. 
Oh, gosh. Thought we could get away. Yeah, we're going to head up north. Let's go full speed now. So while the periscope gives you some visibility when enemies are nearby, if you have nothing, like we're, we're down, we're, we dove down deep and we're in the blue, you, you want to follow your meters, the dive meter, the rudder, and then your speed. Oh gosh, he's still attacking. He's really chasing us because we got full speed. We're all the way down. Can we dive even deeper? Let's go one more down. No, that's it. We're, we're, as, we're as low as we can go. He's still chasing and attacking. They must be dropping depth charges, but following us at the top. But how he's seeing us, I don't know. Because we have our sonar turned off. Alright, that's it. I'm just going to go up. Surface. Let's go one lower. And let's turn the sonar back on. So now we should see... Hey, he followed us all this way! Let's see if we can turn around and get a shot on him. Our speed's still at full. So we're hitting... We're going pretty quick. <laughs> we're doing loop-to-loop -loop at, at a high speed, basically. Let's go. Come on, come on. So we're turning around the other direction. So he's behind us still. Yeah, he's following us. He's probably going to take us out. We had one successful run, and that's good enough for me. I do want to see the end graphic because I remember it would flood the screen whenever you died. A fitting end to sub hunt. Come on. No, we're just looping around. All right, let's do full stop. Go. Stop. Turn around. Let's see if we'll... Yeah, he's going to wipe us out. Notice how many hits it takes? Possibly because we're on the easy difficulty. He's smacking us so many times, but we're still not going down. Waiting for it. Still no visibility. Destroyers are pretty quick compared to the rest of the convoys. Oh, yeah. He's getting lots of hits on now. He... They're now firing torpedoes rather than depth charges. And I wonder what the damage is like. Yeah, so maybe if we were uh, going, since we were going so fast, he was able to follow us. I'd be curious to know why, because we turned sonar off, and we were we were all the way down at the bottom level. He must be the best aim for depth charges to still be able to get us. Oh, we have no, our rudder is not moving, because we're not, uh, we have to put some speed on, I guess, right? Okay, yeah, we were pretty much just sitting ducks. If you have no speed and you try to turn, nothing happens. I do love whenever you shoot off a torpedo, you can see it slowly go off in the distance. Very similar to arcade games we had played. Sea Wolf comes to mind. Oh, wait. He was there like a brief second. I, yeah, he's just right, right with us. Man, we can take a lot. This sub is so powerful. I'm sure if we upped the difficulty and went to like, like level uh, five or five stars, then only a few hits and that would be it. Yeah. Can we? No. Nope, he's like right here. I wasn't able to run away either. But I did get him away from the rest of the convoys. I could lead him away from the convoys and try to sneak back, but I don't think so. He's... And we're still getting attacked and still haven't gone down yet. Oh! Darn, he, yeah, he's just fl flickering through the periscope. Not, not too much. Tons of hits. We also don't have a damage report. There's no meter to letting us know how much we have left. We could possibly be halfway, but we've been hit probably 50 times, and we still haven't gone down. If we can take out the destroyer, though, we can go for the convoys easy. They're just sitting there. On the easy difficulty, I believe it's only one destroyer that comes after you. When you play on the later ones, it's three destroyers or, or more. No, it's right on top of this. Well, I was hoping to see the death scene. It, it, it floods the whole thing and the whole screen just comes up blue when you die. But I think we picked, picked such an easy difficulty that it's 
just not even going to happen. So there you go. There's our taste of sub hunt for the Mattel and television. These are the newest, latest releases of all the games we've seen up to this point that you could play on a home console. I say sub hunt is an excellent title. Uh, four stars, or three stars, depending on how uh, your, your mileage. Uh, if anyone in the chat wants to throw out their rating, I'm going to go. <laughs> oh, it says half star for not having the event. Oh, that's right. The manual says two player. I did turn the controller on and I wasn't able to control other convoys or move anything as the second player. So I'm, I'm not sure. But I was going to say an excellent title for a home console. We're going to go four stars for sub hunt. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. All right, so this one is Bellhop for the Apple II, another title I haven't heard before. Let's take a look at Bellhop, starting with the box. The fun never slows down, and neither do you. The original game by Gary Kitchen and John Van Risen. Ladies and gentlemen, the very first game developed by Gary Kitchen. Published by the Hayden so uh, Software Book Company. Flip it over in the back, and Bellhop's a life full of ups and downs. Rush, rush, rush to make a bunch of hotel guests happy. The elevators never seem to cooperate when you're in a hurry. And you're always in a hurry. And then there's the mischievous hotel ghost who shows up just when you haven't had time for his tricks. Are you quick enough with the feet, the elevator button, and the brain to handle all this? It's another family game. <laughs> family game, okay. From Hayden Software that leaves you limp with laughter. Oh yeah, that's right. It will be a, half, a, a decade later that we'll see that one. Watch for more fun products by Hayden Software. Let's see what other arc we have for Bellhop. So this one is the first game that's done by Gary Kitchen. And it's also, I believe, the first game that had elevators. Just bear in mind, we have no idea what elevator action is. We have no idea what Mappy is. This is kind of taking that concept, what we saw from a platform perspective, you know, with Space Panic, and then t making elevators uh, also available to play. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk we're going to pop in with an example of the screenshot for Bellhop. Let's slide in the disc and play some Bellhop by the Hayden Book Company in the beginning of May 1982. That's true. We are going to see that one. Keystone Capers is a really big one. <laughs> we don't even know what an elevator is. Yes. As far as video games go, we have no idea. I'm trying to think of other games or titles that we've seen platform style. All right, here we go. Bellhop. Gary Kitchen and John Van Risen. Way to go, Gary and John. Taking an idea that, uh, or this perspective. There you go. So this is playing like an arcade game. It's doing an attract mode now. You're playing as the bellhop down at the bottom. Oh, that was it. That was all we got for the attract mode. All right, let's go. This does not use the Apple II joystick or paddle controls. It's keyboard only. So there I am as the bellhop down at the bottom. Got to move myself all the way to the end and grab a suitcase and then move to the left. So the way it works is that your tip's in the bottom left corner, and all you have to do is drop off the suitcases wherever the elevator stops. I'm not controlling this elevator. Yeah, I'm not. And as soon as I walk off, look, drop off the suitcase. Oh, now I'm stuck here. And you gotta wait for the elevators because since you're not controlling them, I'm glad that one came up. Otherwise, we'd be stuck up there a long time. I'm not controlling this elevator either. It's just moving the bellhop left and right. You pick up the suitcase, and let's say we wanna pick up this one. We can stop ourselves and then waiting for the elevator to stop. Once it stops, drop off another one. <laughs> Is there fall damage? Oh, no fall damage. Nice. Okay, so you can just drop off the, the edge of the world and it's no big deal. Cool. All right, so I'm waiting for this to stop again. Who knows where it will be? I think every elevator stops in the same place because the one on the right is stopping at a certain floor. But you're just dropping off suitcases and you see the tip's getting lower and lower. All you do is continue to drop off suitcases until the tip reaches zero. And then you get the score for how many suitcases you're able to drop off. That's it. Uh, so so a weird way to score the game. I think you get points for dropping off suitcases now. So, so you see I picked the same elevator. There's no, nowhere else to go, but I guess stop here and wait for the other, other elevator to come back up. I like that there's no fall damage, though. I was surprised that we have video games now, or 1982, that are uh, platform games that are still, you're getting hurt for falling. We don't need that. It's it's not it's not necessary. Yeah, right? Maybe I should do that as a strategy to move quicker, because you know, we're watching each elevator. They have a, uh, just, um, it doesn't look like they're random, because at least elevator two was doing the same, going up to floor six and coming back. So you can see I can drop off this suitcase. 
and then go back and get another one. But um, that's the idea. Our very first, I, I, you might want to check the stats. I think this is the very first elevator game. It makes sense after all the Apple Panic versions we got on home computers. Here we are on the Apple II playing Bellhop. There we go. Just keep dropping them off. I'm trying to see. Is there any other floors you can go to? Our tip is going down. Tip is essentially your time for the game. I don't think it serves any other purpose. Kind of reminds you of how fresh this perspective is playing the game that that looks like this because we we we've played some platformers that you can jump and this one is just essentially move left and right kind of like apple panic there was no jump button there either <laughs> oh wait it worked we're on the next level okay so if you complete the drop off on one floor then that's it you move to the next level So next level, obviously the next level because the whole thing's a different color. And let's see what floor they're going to take us to now. I don't have... Okay, we'll go to sixth floor as well. The controls are, are only left and right, and then you have one button to stop yourself. And that's it. There, there's nothing else. And there's no power-ups. And uh, if I was going to think of this in terms of Space Panic or Apple Panic... I don't know if I give this one the nod as being the most fun. This honestly feels like we're doing a mundane job. And as usual, when you do a mundane job in a video game, it's great if you're scored for it. But uh, essentially, we're just picking up something and bringing it somewhere else. It's it's the very first fetch quest game ever. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good point. Maybe you have to fill up two floors. I wouldn't think so because the tip is our time. I don't think we'd have the time to fill up two floors unless you really work the game. Uh, you can see the elevators are stopping at other floors. Yeah, we'll go on this one. And it's going to ride... Yeah, we're riding up all the way to six again. Drop it up there, and then... Yeah, fast way down. <laughs> Every now and then when we come across a game I've never heard of, or, or wasn't aware that it existed. I, I love when I, I have people that have played it or it was one of the games that they, they got when it came out in 1982. So uh, please let me know if Bellhop was a game you had played or if you played Bellhop before Space Panic. No, drop, drop. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, we're going to take this one up here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, right, taking the fire escape. Oh, now if you don't hit the... Oh, if you don't even start when the elevator's here, I'm now stuck. Can I start walking? It's only whenever the elevator begins, it's... Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm now stuck. I can't walk down or I can't fall off the edge whenever you want to. It's only a certain time that you can do it. All right, so I would give Apple Panic. It's taking the concept of digging a hole and capturing aliens, just like Hyunkyo Alien, but turned on its side as the nod of, 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 a, of a great side view game that you could play at this point. For Bellhop, I, it's giving us elevators we've never seen before, but as far as gameplay, it's, it's more of a slog. I could see you playing this a little bit just because the, the idea of, you know, you're moving a character around, there you go, and falling through the, the, the shaft, but it's not particularly fun. I'd give this one three stars, like a, a, a pretty average game for the time. I don't want to say it's a bad game, though, because it's it's essentially... Okay, we got four minutes left, four dollars left on our time. That's true. Yeah, I could see you getting bored with it. I mean, if you paid top dollar for it, Hayden Book Company, I believe it was like 30 bucks whenever these came out. There you go. Oh, we're on level three. Oh, no, the ghost they talked about is here. <laughs> you have to wait till you get to level three for the ghost to show up. What is the ghost doing, though? Let's stop on this one. Nope, this one. They did say that the elevator just goes wherever it wants, but what is the... Oh, is the ghost going to, like, remove the the briefcases? 
That would be terrible. Turning a mundane task into something even more mundane. <laughs> well, you pay $1? One dollar $1 for Bellhop back in 1982? How long do you think Gary Kitchen spent programming this with Mr. Ryzen? Yeah, right? Well, for Apple II, and because I mean, I'm pretty sure like the, the, the top dollar Hayden Book Company was about 30 bucks for the, in the day. I don't know what the ghost is doing. Oh, here he is. Can I touch? Go! Oh, the ghost doesn't... Oh, I'm just walking through the ghost. Uh, it doesn't do a thing. All right, there you go. A quick taste of Bellhop. Let's add elevators to video games. I still say around average for the time. I'm not going to fault it because it is uh, a fresh idea and it does get a little boring, but considering all the other titles, um, it, it's, it's still executed pretty well. Considering the other things you could play on a home computer, I'll stay average. It's not doing anything really good or anything really bad. There's a lot worse that we could be playing on your Apple II. <laughs> Oh, right. I hope we're not in the Overlook Hotel. <gasps> Shining the video game. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. Uh, if you think that's crazy, Time Zone that we saw by Sierra Online was $100. $100 for a video game. That's roughly 300 bucks now for one game. Blows my mind still. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see what's next. Next is the latest release of Analog Computing. Let's flip through... Analog and see what's going on in the world of Atari, the magazine for Atari computer owners. Really love the front of this uh, front of the front of the magazine cover. It's like uh, Tron, uh, Tron esque 3D graphics almost. Pretty cool coming out from the side there. This is going to have pirating software. No one would pirate software. Also, Maniac and Typing Trainer. Let's breeze through a few of the ads. Want to get your Atari computer up to 32K? Then buy this, $179.95 from Mosaic. Here's an ad for Mouse Attack, which we've also played. Pretty cool title for the time. You can see this one, uh, Online Systems does this for $34.95 on disk. Uh, yeah, for disk. On the Atari 800 or 400. That's a cool one to check out. And then here's pretty cool. This is an ad for Compute Publications. Uh, Compute put out a few books. Compute's first book of Atari and the first book of pet CBM, and they've done a few other books. Compute is one of the reasons why we don't do all type-in games, because we'd be here forever. Uh, there are several games that they put in these books that you can type into your system. Really, really popular. You can see, like, uh, $12. You'd be getting uh, 50, 60 games. Of course, you have to type them in, but a, a good deal. Compute's pretty cool with that. <laughs> And then it's like, yeah, right. It's like S Super Mario. If you <laughs> Mario doesn't even exist right now. He's called the Brave Carpenter when we played Donkey Kong. But it is. It's like a uh, an adult version of Mario. <laughs> That's true. It is pretty expensive. We're gonna breeze by the table of contents because we're gonna pretty much be going through the entire one. All right. So the editorials has this is a year's worth of analog. They did 14 months because I believe they do every other month here on a regular basis. Analog computing uh, is mostly for the Atari computer enthusiast. So they have a lot of things involving, uh, you can see here on the right side, they have the corrections put in from previous magazines. Or like, sorry, this code we put in wasn't correct. Here's here's the correct ones. They blame it on gremlins here or something like that. Uh, so this is the year issue. And they have a few things for reader comments of people that sent in a few things. Like uh, we have here... Uh, editors of Analog Number no. 4, Multigraphics. He says he had a problem with some of the code and needed some help with it. So it's almost like they're doing, doing troubleshooting, helping you with the, the code for your video games. Or also just troubleshooting in general. Like, you know, my system has problems. I need some help. Write into the magazine and they'll give you some answers. And then here's people that were complaining about shooting gallery and they're calling it defective and wants their money back. And they're like, we're sorry, we had a problem with your cassette. We loaded your cassette and had no problems. Of course they did. That's what tech support always says. And then someone else says, we love Shooting Gallery. It's fantastic. Judy Silverman had a great time with Shooting Gallery. Here's someone that, as an Atari, happy Atari owner, I wanted to ask you all other owners to spread the good word about Atari computers. In this hectic competitive world, only increasing sales can ensure the continued growth and development of a product. I would like to see Atari become a dominant leader in the personal computer market. They are up there, but right now it's Commodore VIC-20 and Apple II that are the best sellers. <laughs> yes. Typing in programs. There's a huge one here. Uh, I'm really excited to show, show that one off. 
Okay, so this one is another ad we're going to breeze by here by Cybersoft. And then some more uh, editorials just writing in. Can you explain what a mem save file is? And then they go, yeah, your wish is our command. We have an issue. In this issue, we explain what mem save files are. Uh, kind of makes you wonder, is it really someone that wrote in or they just wanted to make an article and then made, made up Judy Faulkner from Hearst, Texas? Are you real, Judy? Or Jody, sorry, Jody Faulkner? Or did they just write that in because they want to talk about mem save files? And then here's just um, talking about the disk drive they purchased. And man, they uh, disk drive, the 8, 810, that's that's primo. 200 bucks, I believe, at the time for the 810. You can't quote me on that because uh, prices change as the years go on. And so when we read these magazines, I'm doing my best to to get the exact price, but it's uh, it, it does it does fluctuate. And they're talking about the interference at the stopwatch and basic loading. And then if you want any back issues of Analog Magazine, you can order those as well. I remember when I first come across magazines like this, if it's, if it's a really good magazine, I want all of them. I want to start collecting all of them. Yeah, the books of typing programs were a, a very popular for the time. <laughs> oh, that's true. They, they were a great deal for how many games you could get, type in. But uh, if the code wasn't correct or you spent a long time typing it in and it doesn't work, it's terrible. It takes a long time. That's true. And we, we can see here in the magazine, there's prices uh, where they slash them. They, they kind of change the price for those games, um, depending on where you buy them from. So here is, this is from educational software, graphics to sound made easy. A few other, yeah, this is uh, different dealers. And you can see the, the prices here for, uh, this is more application software, whatever. Okay, so this one's by Mark Russell Binioff. Uh, showing you some of the cool things that are happening in the world of computing. On March 19th through the 21st, 1982, was the West Coast Computer Fair uh, held in San Francisco. 33 new Atari products were announced, and some of them were top names like Apple, Gabelli Software, Budge, uh, or uh, uh, Bill Budge Software, Brodabun, Online and Cavalier, and then translations that are coming to Atari, because right now we're still getting the, these developers going for Apple II first, and so the Atari gamers are like, please, give us some ap Apple games. I mean, give us some Atari games. So Raster Blaster has been completed, and there, I think I believe we've already seen that one, and then Datasoft has five new products, Micro Painter, and then Tumblebugs, uh, Rockland has a few games coming out, soon to be released, Pac-Man, announced 10 more software products that are going to be coming out. And then Arcade Plus, the makers of Ghost Hunter, which I was a very pleasantly surprised with Ghost Hunter. Didn't know about that one. They have a few more games that are coming out, like Night Rally, Arcade Baseball, and Arcade Football. They're going to run on the 400 with 16K. Brodabun Software has Apple Panic, which I think we already saw that one. And then Donkey Kong, Midnight Magic, Track Attack, Star Blazer, a lot of fun games coming out there. And then Online Systems has, the, oh, they call it the makers of Jawbreaker. That's how big Jawbreaker was. Yeah, original 2600, I believe, was about 30 bucks when it came out. Computer titles are a little different because you can get different deals for it, depending on where you buy them. So five new programs for the Atari. We got Threshold, Crossfire, Guns of uh, Nubron, Frogger, just completed by uh, John Harris. Haven't seen that one yet. We saw Crossfire already. And then Cavalier Computer announced that Bug Attack is going to be ready for the Atari presently. And then uh, SSI announced three new games, Battle of Shiloh, Tigers in the Snow, and Shattered Alliance. So these are all the, like, what's coming? What's the hot new computer titles that are going to be uh, on your Atari home computer? Gabelli Software plans to release their first cartridge game called Embargo. Haven't seen that one yet. And then Horizon 5, we've seen Zenith, not yet. And then uh, we have some excellent new games and programs for Atari computers. Look forward to an awesome year coming up. And Airstrike. Buy some Airstrike now. And we have some new products. Don't Ask Computer Software announces the ability, uh, availability of Abuse, a uh, revolutionary new program that gives the home computer a wicked mind of its own. Transforms the mild-mannered machines into rude, slightly demented smart Alex, whose purpose is to exchange insults to the operator. We're not going to be playing that because it's more like software, but fun little quirky game uh, or application software. Abuse if you ever check those out. It's the kind you, where you, you know you, you you type in a bunch of swear words and it says things back to you just for fun. Uh, and then after abuse, it says it's gonna be 20 bucks for that one. And then they talk about uh, Britain's latest Atari games. This is Thorn EMI and Creative Computing. And we've seen titles by them already. Thorn EMI, I'm a big fan of. I love how they design their box and present the game. It's all done very, very well. Britain's most popular Atari game, Darts. That's right, Darts. And I am, I'm with them. Darts was awesome. It's one of the best 
Atari games out there. And then Tilt, Dominoes, Cribbage, a few other ones, if you want some board games. And then we have the ready-to-use reprogrammable video disc system. That's right. Look at that. A laser disc in 1982. And I think that's the system. Yeah, what is the cost for that sucker? This must be something they brought up at the um, uh, the, the, the the trade show. Yeah, it's the Discmaster 5000, whatever that means. But using a laser disc with your Atari computer, it's 1982. That's ridiculous. All right, so next we have the Atari software, uh, something you can get is air traffic controller, pool, original adventure. So we've seen all these. There it is, darts with the screenshot. I still say darts has a really good music sound. Using the pokey chip of the Atari home computer is pretty cool. This is all creative computing software. Great titles there. And then now we have some reviews they do. Their reviews have a rating system on a scale of 1 to 10. So this is pool 1.5. And uh, this is Tom Hudson. And then if we go to the bottom, you can see how they rate it. They have a concept, originality, challenge, skill, graphics, and the overall rating. Uh, they say 7 out of 10. I said it was 4 stars when we played Pool 1.5. Really cool and great playing pool game for the Atari home computer. And then we have a preview of Atari's Pac-Man and Centipede. Now, we haven't seen these yet. They say it was announced at the January CES Las Vegas. We're going to see Pac-Man at the end of May, and then Centipede is going to come out in June for the Atari home computer. And we've already seen countless, and I'm talking countless, uh, Pac-Man and Centipede variants already on the home computer. These are the official releases, like actually Pac-Man, actually Centipede. And we're, we're seeing a trend, too. When a, a game is released in the arcades, a really popular one, and we just had, like for example, Zaxxon. Zaxxon's first release in the arcades, and then what happens is we get knockoffs and copies on the home computer space, and then eventually we get official releases on console, and then the official releases show up after the console, then they show up on the home computer. That seems to be a certain trend uh, so far. And we also do get handheld, but they're all over the place. Who, who knows whenever those, those will come out. All right, so there's some screenshots of Pac-Man, official Pac-Man, and Centipede, and then expand your Atari to 32K. Okay, here we go. This one's cool. This is Maniac. Maniac is a type-in game, and this is by Rick Messner. Over the past several years, many programs have been deployed for the Atari computers. Unfortunately, most of the game programs cost from $30 to $40 a piece. Taking pity on those who, like myself, cannot afford to buy those great games, I programmed an arcade-style game called Maniac. Fast action assembly language game is yours for the price of an hour or two of typing. You're going to like this game. Now, that's what Rick says about the game. This is a... I'm not even going to talk about it or explain it because we're going to play this game. Uh, I want to show you the code on how this works because this one is one of the longest type-in games I've seen on analog computing so far. Check this out. Here's the code. He says an hour or two of typing all of that. I would say an afternoon maybe of typing everything. And then you have to get it right. One mistake though, and you have to go through the whole thing all over again. Right? They probably didn't copycats. Uh, it, that's what I love about this age of video games. There's so many copycats. It's so fun and fresh. There's not a bunch of people waving their suing finger at, at, at things. <laughs> yes, Rick says you're going to love this game. And we will be checking that one out after we get through the magazine. And then we have an ad for Artworks that's next. I'm really, really excited to show Maniac. It's pretty cool. And then our next section is The Program Doctor. About uh, some more games coming out. The first one is Match Racer by Gabelli Software. Uh, they give it a 7.6 for Match Racer. There's the example of the screenshot. It had visually some some appeal to it, but the rest of the game wasn't that original. I don't know why they're rating it that way. We give it a, a slightly above average for Match Racer. Then we have a review for Soft Porn Adventure, the one by Online Systems. You need 48K for it. And if we look at the review, they, they give it overall rating of five stars, saying it's a good party adventure. It's proven to be entertaining and funny. Many hours of enjoyment will be spent solving this delightful fantasy, to which a sequel is already in the works. And I don't know what they're referring to unless, are they talking about Leisure Suit Larry already? Because I know that that's what Soft Porn Adventure eventually turned into, that tongue-in-cheek like uh, style game. Oh yeah, there's a lot that would crash it. And we're not going to crash the game here, uh, thankfully. All right, next review is Crazy Shootout. Loved this one. It is a, a Berserk variant. You can see at the screenshot up there. 
and they give crazy shootout a 9.3 we as well we gave it four stars whenever we played it excellent title um crazy shootout check that one out and then over here we have an ad for dodge racer and then uh the rest is a lot of more technical or development style tools and analog does that this one is uh, using uh dli to twinkle at starfield powerful computers in the market and at last we have atari 6502 processor for its brain they're just raving about it here we have an ad for adventure international <laughs> that was your first one your very first one little chip tune playing leisure suit larry that's going to be a ways later. I mean, we have in 1984, whenever we first get King's Quest as a true graphic adventure game, still with the text parser. And another ad by Adventure International. Nice. So you can see this is all some more type in applications, not just games that you could play on your home computer. Here's one is, is, is a typing trainer, so an educational style game. Go ahead and type it in. Play it now. Or if you want to train yourself to type. Yes, Alibaba. That's the one to play. We played Alibaba and the 40 Thieves on the Apple II. It's okay. It's it's good. But Alibaba and the 40 Thieves for the Atari is where it's at. First time that... Yeah, Stuart Smith did that one. Really good. Love that one. Oh, a friend's computer. Yes. Oh, nine, Windows 95. Yeah, I didn't have... Um, some of the computer games I played first were on friend's computers too. Here's another application for running basic automatically. We'll just breeze by that one. And then another one, which is an assembler code... Uh, subroutine adder pretty cool stuff again for the developers but we're here for the games and then next we have an ad for <laughs> crystalware fantasy land treasure island bermuda experience haunted palace we've seen all these by crystalware or crystal vision oh that's another one yeah it's crystalware and then we have uh moon base io battle for the moons of jupiter from beyond software pdi and then we have a, an article on pirating software <laughs> this is your captain, B.B. Roberts speaking. For those of you who are crew pirates or pirates <laughs> or passengers or the good guys, another article about pirating because it's still rampant. It's happening now, even in 1982. Really long article about this one and pirating software. <laughs> I, that's true. Would you call them homebrew? I know we call them nowadays homebrew, but for typing, um, I'm calling them as, as, as uh, not an official release or a commercial release. Next is an ad for the Shattered Alliance. It's, it's a, a strategic simulation, putting their toes in to play a strategic game, but adding fantasy to the mix. It's like the, 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 the beginning of when they get the gold box Advanced Dungeons and Dragons games. So that's cool. Uh, we've played that, played that one. A very great title, but very complicated. How you can speed up basic. Put some more type in there. And then a variable list, lister here. So analog is definitely for the developer, for your Atari computer. And then we have a very small article, look at this, so tiny, about your Atari VCS. Thanks, Lee, for putting this in there. So April 3rd, 1982 was officially touted as Pac-Man Day. Atari Pac-Man and Ghost were made public appearances that weekend in Worcester, Massachusetts, then pr proceeded to Boston to make visits to local orphans' homes and walk the historic Freedom Trail. And so the new VCS game from I Magic is Star Voyager and trick shot and then parker brothers is going to bring empire strikes back and frogger so this very little small snippet is about the atari home console and spider-man is also coming later this year and then they say this again we had this in um the other atari magazine coleco says they're bringing all these games donkey kong turbo venture ladybug mousetrap carnival zaxxon cosmic venger smurf action game but they don't say the coleco vision they just say coleco is going to be releasing these on the Atari VCS and it's coming out. Oh yeah. Coleco vision's coming. There's a picture from Pac-Man day. And uh, next one is a tutorial for program protection. We can breeze by that one. We have a hardware review for some of the hardware for the Atari. Going to breeze by that. Any more applications don't need that. And then assembly language language software breeze by those get to the game reviews. There we go. Software review for Caverns of Mars. And I think this is the third or fourth, fourth one. Everyone's raving about Caverns of Mars. It's so good. And I'm with them. 8.8. .8, I'd go even higher. I think we gave four stars or four and a half stars for Caverns of Mars. Really good one. And then here's the review for Dodge Racer by Synapse Software. Another one that we, I think we rated this one four stars too. Oh wait, that was the head-on one. I think we gave three and a half for this one. They give 6.4 it's bare bones, head-on uh, clone you could play. 
And then we have Nuke Sub and Galaxy Defender. Pretty average title for the time. And uh, I do like... Oh, no. It's ripped. We'll never know the rating that Analog gave for Nuke Sub and Galaxy Defender. Too bad. And then their next game is Crush, Crumble, and Chomp. A game that's based on playing Godzilla-style games. It's, it's pretty good for the time. It, it has great presentation, but it's still, it still kind of tricks you. It says, oh, you're, you're going to beat up some, uh, destroy things and be Godzilla or be a monster. But it's more of a tactical game or a strategy game. Because you're having to send commands to the monster, not just control them yourself. But they say it's great, well written, and they give Crush, Crumble, and Chomp 8.2 for their rating. And then we have a graphics composer that you could type in yourself. And... House of Usher by Crystalware. This one's interesting because Crystalware is known to have very buggy games. And I rated this one very high of, of the ambition of the game. But they say House of Usher, they're giving it 6.4. And they said only then I can see how people who have not been exposed to higher quality games enjoying and playing this game. At $29.95, you'll get darn near three Scott Adams adventures or the price of Wizard and the Princess. This game just can't compete because they say the game is... It needs, it needs to be debugged. It needs to be fixed. There's too many problems with House of Usher, and that'd be the biggest problems with Crystal Weir games. I still give them a tip of the hat because it, the, you do have to get through the bugs, and by now, the releases I have, you know, you have to spend the time to rewind your tape and play it again. It, it Everything loads and works for us, but back then, I can understand the frustration. And then we have Protector, a title that we almost missed. We will be checking this one out. Uh, it's already released, uh, and we're going to see Protector 2 later this year. They rate this one so high. 9.2 is their overall rating for Protector. We'll be seeing that one by the end of May 1982. And I believe that is it. The rest of the articles are, yeah, we got a disc menu, some other software, and then a few ads to breeze through. Uh, I think that is, yeah, the last one is just an ad for Rear Guard. We've seen a few versions of that. There's a few screenshots for the different versions down there, too. So there you go. Analog Computing's May issue of 1982. So cool to see what the future holds in the world of home computing and Atari. I really want to be up to date on what happens with Atari because you and I both know what's going to happen next year. And it's going to be a slow burn to see <laughs> the unveiling of the crash. All right, so that's where I leave everyone on our quest playing every single game or checking out everything in the video game industry. Like I always say, save often and save repeatedly. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.